you have your Bibles with you this morning, I'd ask you to open up to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. This morning we're going to look at the unpardonable sin. We've come as far as Matthew chapter 12, verse 21. And in these first 21 verses, we have seen how Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. This morning, we're going to look at one of the most important and misunderstood passages in the Bible. And that is the unpardonable sin. In verses 31 and 32, Jesus is going to specifically state exactly what the unpardonable sin is. I want to give you a very brief list here of some of the sins that get called the unpardonable sin. Or I guess a better way of saying it is, I want to give you a list of what it is not. Just a very brief list. The unpardonable sin is not fornication. It's not homosexuality. It's not lying. It's not stealing. And it's not even murder. Some of those wrongly get called the unpardonable sin. All those are still sins. Amen. But they are all forgivable sins. Jesus tells us the unpardonable sin is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now why is this so important for believers and non-believers to understand? We must have a firm grasp on what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit because our eternity is at stake. We are talking about the only sin that cannot be forgiven. We're actually going to begin in verses 31 and 32 and then we'll go back and cover 22 to 30. Because doing it this way, I feel, gives us a, a firm handle on not only what blasphemy is, but what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is. And then we will see in verses 22 to 30 why Jesus brings it up because the Pharisees give us an example of this. They're guilty of this as they continue to reject Jesus. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you for just allowing us to be here this morning. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, to just open up the hearts and minds of everybody here sitting in the pew, Lord, here in the pulpit, those watching online, listening, watching later. Oh, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you help me, Lord, to get out of the way and let you do all the speaking this morning. Hide me behind the cross, Lord. Let you do all the speaking. Let us hear what we need to hear from you, Lord. Lord, we do love you. We ask you to be with all those names added to the prayer list this morning, Lord. As I certainly add my prayers to all those mentioned, Lord. Amen. All those already on the list, Lord. So many need a healing touch from you, Lord. So many need a comforting touch that only you can provide. And Lord, we know some, even in our own families, need to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord God, that even today they would give their lives to you, burden their hearts to be saved. Lord, we do love you and thank you for all you do for us. And we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as I said, we'll start in verse 31 here. Blasphemy and the unpardonable sin. Unpardonable just means unforgivable. So let's look at verses 31 and 32. Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. 
But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Notice Jesus begins there. He says, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. The Greek word here for not is u, and it's the word, it is the absolute negative adverb. It means not ever, cannot ever be forgiven. To understand this, we first must understand what blasphemy is because it's not something I think that we stress enough and people can get confused about what it is and what it is not. So we're going to talk first about blasphemy in general and then we will look at what Jesus means when he says blaspheming the Holy Spirit. To blaspheme in general means to do one of three things, or you could say there's three categories of it. They are, number one, denying the power of God or thinking or saying that God cannot do something. Number two, making someone or something else equal with God. Number three, accrediting God's work to someone else. Let's begin with the first. Denying the power of God or thinking God can't do something. Before you quickly dismiss this and say, oh, I've never done that before, stop and think for a minute. Be honest with yourself. Sometimes things happen and circumstances come up in our lives and suddenly we think we have to fix it. Not we turn to God and God guides us and tells us how to fix it, but we think we have to do it on our own. We think that we have to fix it because only we can fix it. Which is to say, even if we don't actually say the words, we are saying, God cannot fix this, I have to fix this. Maybe you've never done that. I can certainly tell you I have. But I do know this. The good news is, when I do this, or if you've ever done it, God remembers that we are but dust, and He forgives me, He forgives you if you've done it. So that's the first type or category of blasphemy. The second category or way of blaspheming is making someone else equal with God. This is what the nation of Israel would do when they tried to worship both Jehovah God and Baal or any of the other false gods. They were elevating those Canaanite gods to be equal with Jehovah. It's blasphemy. This is also what the Pharisees accused Jesus of doing when he would say that he is the Son of God. When he would claim his deity, this is what they're accusing him of doing. They're saying he is making himself equal with God and that's blasphemy. And they would be correct except for one detail. He is God. Hallelujah. So therefore it is not blasphemy, it is truth. He can rightfully claim that He is God. He is equal with the Father. He is equal with the Holy Spirit. So that's the second category of general blasphemy. The third is accrediting God's work to someone else. An example of this could be when cults attribute miracle healings or other miracles to some false god instead of the one true god. There, of course, could be many other examples. We won't go into those. But those, in general, are what blasphemy is. And if you're guilty or ever have been guilty of any of these three, 
That is, again, denying the power of God, making someone else equal with God, or accrediting God's work to someone else, you're guilty of blasphemy. Under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, anyone guilty of blasphemy would be stoned to death. We know that from Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. But Jesus said, right here we looked at it, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. You see, this is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Jesus said, if you've ever committed this sin, it can be forgiven just like any other sin. How? The same way all forgivable sins are forgiven. By confessing with your mouth that you are a sinner and you want Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. You ask Him to forgive you of your sins and then you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. Now we'll talk about specifically blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Which again, cannot be forgiven. Not because I say it, but Jesus says it. This can be done one of three ways. Number one, to say Christ is demon possessed or empowered by Satan. Pharisees are guilty of this one. Number two, to reject the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Number three, when believers, or some would say so-called believers, depending on your personal beliefs, think there is another way to God other than Jesus. The first way to say Jesus is demon-possessed or that He is empowered by Satan is what we'll see exactly that the Pharisees are guilty of when we get to verse 24 as we kind of go backwards. I want you to keep this in mind. Get a firm grip on this. When they accuse Jesus of being empowered by Satan, they know exactly who He is. They know exactly what they're saying. They know He is the Messiah. They know it. Everything He has done can only be through God's power. They know this, yet they make this false claim anyway. Because if they admit openly who He is, how can they be against Him? The people will turn against them. They will lose their power and their prestige. So they know as it comes out of their mouth, it's a lie. He is not empowered by Satan. So how is this blaspheming the Holy Spirit? To understand this, we must go back to when Jesus became a man. We call this His incarnation. He laid down His independent use of His godness, or you could say His independent use of divine power. He did not stop being God, but He laid down His independent use of His deity, of His divine power. We know this Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, when he says he emptied himself. He laid down his independent use of this. That means that every miracle that Jesus did, from turning water to wine to raising Lazarus from the dead and all in between, and all of them, every single one of them, was done through the Holy Spirit's godness or through His divine power. So that is how when the Pharisees say this in verse 24, let me go ahead and read it even though we'll cover it again. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. That is Satan. When they say this, they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. 
They are saying that Jesus is empowered by Satan, not by God. Now before we go on to the second and the third way to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, let me say this. You do not have to worry about blaspheming the Holy Spirit in this way today because Jesus is not here with us. He is physically not on the earth right now. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So this form of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be done. You cannot attribute the things Jesus is doing to Satan. He is not here doing, physically doing, performing these miracles. You may say, well, what about when he comes back and he sets up his millennial kingdom? Well, you won't have to worry about it then either. Because... When he comes back, he will not lay down his independent use of his godness. He will be, everything he does when he's sitting on the throne in his millennial kingdom will be through his own divine power. So you won't, you don't have to, you cannot do what the Pharisees did here in this exact way. With that being said, we will look at the other two. You see, the Pharisees have consistently rejected Him despite knowing He is the Messiah. They have gotten to the point, again here, where they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Knowing exactly what they're saying, knowing ex it's not done out of ignorance. It's done out of willful disobedience and unbelief. They refuse to believe. They refuse to, to acknowledge. They know who He is. I ask you this morning, do you know who He is? The second way to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject the Holy Spirit when He draws us or He convicts us of our sins and testifies of Jesus and makes the truth known to us. The Apostle John writes this in John chapter 15 verse 26. And then he talks about it again in chapter 16 verses 14 and 15. He convicts us of our sin. He testifies of Jesus and makes the truth known to us. That is in his drawing us to Jesus. If you're here and you know the Lord is... Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, this is that unexplainable feeling that you got when you heard the Word of God and you knew you needed to be saved. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you, speaking to you. And to reject Him is to blaspheme Him. And you may be thinking, but I did reject Him. One, two, ten times. It's unpardonable because there will come a time when He no longer draws you. He will no longer convict you. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you did reject Him time after time after time. But then, there came a time when He convicted you, He drew you, and you did not reject Him. I remember it very well. Right over here. It's unpardonable because there will come a day when He will no longer draw you. God says all the way back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, that His Spirit will not always strive with man. It is very important if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that when you feel Him putting you under conviction, when you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you, He makes it very clear to you you're a sinner in need of saving, that you do not reject Him because that very well may be the last time that He draws you. We don't know. 
We don't know when the last time will be. It may be your last opportunity. My intent is not to scare anyone, but to speak the truth and make it known. Because people need to know we are not guaranteed a tomorrow. If He is speaking to you even right now, this may be your last shot. Why would you put it off? When He stops drawing you, that is it. There is no, God give me one more chance. When He stops, He stops. That is why it is vital that we understand this. To reject the Holy Spirit as He's speaking to you is to reject the free gift of salvation. And there will come a day when it is no longer offered. Eternity is at stake. That's why as believers we must stress to unbelievers they need to be here. They need to hear God's Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. How can they hear if they're not here to hear it? How can they know what God's Word says if they don't have a Bible to open up? I hope you understand the significance and, and the importance of this. So that's the second way. First way, again, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. To say Christ is demon-possessed or empowered by Satan. The second way is to reject the Holy Spirit, which people do all, all the time. And the third way, when believers, or you may think they're not true believers, think there is another way to God other than Jesus. Now I say believers or you may think they're not believers because it depends on what you believe, whether or not you believe they were ever actually saved or not. You may think they just claim to be a believer because no true believer can say there is another way to God other than Jesus. You may think they were never saved. They just played the role. They just they sat in a pew. They sung the songs. They opened their Bibles. But they never truly believed. Or you may think they did at some point. And just like with Judas Iscariot, at some point they stopped believing and went off the path. They veered off on a tangent. Whichever way you believe... You have to decide that for you. But the point is, anyone who says there is another way to God other than Jesus is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. There is no other way. There is no other way. How do we know that? Jesus Himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John chapter 14, verse 6. So if we say there is another way to God other than Jesus, we call Jesus Himself a liar, we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and that is unforgivable. You have turned away from the truth. You have rejected the only one who can save you. Just like with the second way, when you... When you reject the Holy Spirit as He draws you, you are rejecting the only one who can save you. His ministry is to lead people to Jesus and help them be more like Jesus. So if these people were never saved, they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit by rejecting Him. If they were saved... They blaspheme the Holy Spirit by turning away from the truth here and say there is another way to God other than Jesus. Either way, they have committed the unpardonable sin. And I believe this ties directly to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, which says, I'll read it for you so you don't have to turn there. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, 
and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. They have fallen away. They have turned away from the truth. Jesus says blaspheming Him is forgivable. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, shouldn't that be just as bad as blaspheming the Holy Spirit? But Jesus says, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven. And he says in verse 32, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. And then I remember a man named Saul of Tarsus. Y'all remember him? Prime example. He was guilty of, of, of saying, speaking against Jesus. He blasphemed Jesus. He said, Jesus is not the Son of God. Anybody who followed Jesus who was a Christian, even though they didn't call him that at the time, he said they have turned from God and he actually went out and hunted them down and put them in prison and even had some put to death. And what does he tell Timothy as he's writing this first Epistle to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he admits he was guilty of this. He said, I was a blasphemer. I did, I said Jesus was not who he says he is. He was like the other Pharisees. Remember, Paul or Saul was a Pharisee, and he thought when Jesus claimed deity, he was blaspheming God. He firmly believed it. Until he met Jesus. And Jesus quite literally opened his eyes by making him blind. And then opened his eyes again. And then what does Jesus do? He takes this blasphemer after he changes him from Saul to Paul and makes him the apostle to the Gentiles. Look how many books of what we call the New Testament Paul writes. Again, Jesus says, Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Peter denied him three times. And what did Jesus do? He forgave him. And Peter goes on to be the head apostle. But blaspheming the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. Cannot will not ever be forgiven. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, I believe, make it very clear why this is the unpardonable sin. To have tasted, to have been in fellowship with God and through the Holy Spirit, and then to fall away, So we have looked at all three ways to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. All three are unpardonable. They're all part of that unpardonable or unforgivable sin. We must have a firm grasp of this because again, eternity is at stake. This is very, very important. Now we'll go back and we'll cover verses 22 to 30 and we'll see continued rejection and an example of blasphemy. The Pharisees continue to reject Jesus. They know exactly again who He is. Verses 22 and 23. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and He healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? 
First of all, how did Jesus heal this man? He cast out the demon who in this particular case was the cause of his blindness and his muteness. This isn't always the case. It's not always being demon-possessed that causes these infirmities. But in this particular case, it was. How do we know this? Because when Jesus cast out the demon, the man, he speaks and he sees. And then in verse 23, the crowd witnessed this and they're trying to figure out, could he really be the Messiah? Could he really be the son of David. That's a messianic term. Could he really be the one we've been waiting for? They're amazed at what he has done. They're amazed at what they have seen and experienced. And they're trying to figure this out. And then in verse 24, here come our old, not so friends, the Pharisees. And again, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, knowing that when they say this, they are lying, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And again, that is Satan himself. So here you can see they are accrediting God's work to someone else, in this case, Satan. They've committed blasphemy in this way. And... They have blasphemed the Holy Spirit by saying Christ is empowered by Satan. Double guilty. And they know it. This is not accidental. They deliberately did this. They know exactly what they're saying. They care more about their power, prestige, and, and getting <laughs> all this attention and, and, and being elevated above the people from all the people than they do about the truth. To the point where they blaspheme God and the Holy Spirit. They know. They know who He is. They know what He is doing can only be done by the power of God. Satan does not have the same powers as God. Satan is a created being. God is the creator. They are not only blasphemers, but they are liars and they are hypocrites. Verses 25 and 26. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. Y'all thought Abraham Lincoln come up with that, didn't you? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln quoted Jesus. Jesus didn't quote Abraham Lincoln. Verse 26. <laughs> if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Jesus is bringing out the absolute stupidity of what they have just said. Kingdoms divided crumble by their own doing and houses divided fall. No kingdom, country, household, or anything else can fight against itself and endure. Since I brought Lincoln up, Lincoln understood this during the Civil War. He knew this had to be fixed quickly or our country would not last. Jesus says in verse 26, if Satan casts himself out or if he casts out his demons who represent him, his, he divides his own kingdom and it cannot stand. Jesus' point is, Satan would not do this. I want you to understand this. Satan is many, 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 many things. Stupid is not one of them. He is very good at what he does. And it would be absolutely stupid for him to go around casting out his own demons that possess people. Their blasphemous statement that Jesus is empowered to cast out demons by Satan is asinine. It is absolute absurdity. But yet, they would rather go with that than the truth. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The world we live in. They'd rather go on believing a lie than hear the truth. 
Verse 27, Jesus says, If I by Beelzebul cast out demons, whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about Jewish exorcists. And he says, okay, if I'm doing this by Satan's power, who's giving them the power to do it? They're doing the same thing I'm doing. So he's saying then you must be saying they're also empowered by Satan to be able to do this. If Satan has made it part of his goal to cast out his own demons, then clearly Satan must be giving them the power to do it also. And he's making this point. They would never admit this. They would never say this about their own exorcists. And he's making this point of how asinine this is, how stupid this is. He's saying, so you're saying they must also be satanically empowered. He knows they would never admit this. And because he knows they will never say this, he says, for this reason, they will be your judges. They will judge the Pharisees. They knew what they were saying was a bold-faced lie, and yet they said it anyway. Verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Whew, they didn't want to hear that. Jesus is saying to them, if he cast out the demons by the Holy Spirit, that is the Spirit of God, then it means the kingdom of God is upon them. And you know what that means? If the kingdom of God is upon them, that means the king is the one standing before them. The king is the one they have just falsely accused. The king is the one talking to them. The word if here is a primary particle of conditionality, which simply means what we already know. Jesus cast out demons using the Holy Spirit's godness or divine power. It's not Satan's power. It's God's power. Verse 29. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. What is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is very simply making an illustration here or an analogy. He says he has the power and the authority to bind Satan. In this analogy, Satan is the strong man. The property is the demons. And he says, in order to cast out demons, the strong man must be bound. You cannot just go in and do it, and then his house will be plundered. Jesus is very simply using an analogy to say he is stronger than the strong man. He is the one who has the power. It is God's power. You see, you don't mess with the strong man unless you know you're stronger than the strong man. Unless you like get your tail whipped. Jesus knows Satan is but a mere created being. And he knows he is part of the Godhead. That's what he's saying with this. That's all it means. He knows he is stronger. Verse 30. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Could he be more perfectly clear than he is in that verse? He who is not with me is against me. It was true when he said it. It's true today. If you... Do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You are against Him. <coughs> you may be the best old boy that's ever lived. Best old girl that's ever lived. You don't bother nobody. You don't, you don't do anything to hurt anybody. You just get up, go to work, mind your own business. If you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, you are against Him. Very clearly. You don't have to like it, but it is true. 
And then he says, anyone who is against me will be scattered. They will not be with him. So I say to you this morning, if you're here and you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, we're getting ready to give you an opportunity. Because the Holy Spirit is making the truth known, speaking to you about Jesus, drawing you to Him. Do not reject Him today. Today could be the last time He speaks to you. It is very important that you say yes to Him today. At this time, I'll ask Sister Carla if she would come back up to the piano. We've looked at blasphemy, and specifically the unpardonable sin. We've talked about what it is, and we briefly mentioned what it is not. It is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and it has eternal consequences. It is vital that as believers and non-believers, we understand this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we get ready to do our invitation. What are you waiting for? Page 327. If you would, open your hymnals and stand as we do our invitation. does not mean the Lord is through with you. If you're watching us live, you watch or listen later, if you're sitting here, standing here with us, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, let today, as I have no doubt the Holy Spirit is drawing you, let today be the day you say yes to Him. Do not add one more no to the list because it very well could be the last opportunity you have. Again, I don't want to scare anybody, but I would not be doing my job as a minister if I did not share the truth of the gospel with you. <coughs> that is the truth. We do not know how many opportunities we will have. At this time, we'll go ahead and end our...